All right, we are, uh, we're already drifting from our 6.15 start time that we, uh, that we established this fall. Um, again, I welcome you uh, tonight. Uh, we're con continuing, or, uh, continuing our fall uh, Wednesday night series, and, um, and I'm uh, honored to be joined by my friend, John Gear, and he's going to come uh, in just a little bit, and uh, I'll say a few words about John before he, before he c comes up. We uh, continue to live in very uh, interesting uh, political times. I think uh, everybody would acknowledge that, regardless of your, your party. Um, the last two years uh, have, have, have been uh, interesting, uh, to say the least. And the midterm elections, which are now uh, less than two months away, uh, will be uh, also very interesting and, and very telling. Um, I wanted to share just a couple of thoughts with you when I made the decision um, at Sewanee to, to do work in this area of faith and politics, um, my interest, as most of you know or have heard, was always the issue of civility and um, how can we try to keep the polarization that's present in our culture from bleeding over into the church? How can we let the love of Christ uh, uh, you know, transcend uh, political and social differences? Um, one of the questions that, that you wrestle with is what is the role of religion uh, in American culture? And uh, John Meacham, who's actually uh, taught a class with John Gear at, at Vanderbilt, wrote a great book called American Gospel, uh, God, the Founding Fathers, and the Making of a Nation. And in that book, Meacham says this, the great goodness about America, the American gospel, if you will, is that religion shapes the life of the nation without strangling it. Belief in God is central to the country's experience, yet for the broad center, faith is a matter of choice, not coercion, and the legacy of the Founding Fathers is that the sensible center holds. Now, we could argue about whether the sensible center is holding in our culture, uh, but that's what Meacham says uh, in American Gospel. The other thing that has interested me uh, over the years is just the question of what is it that makes somebody liberal or conservative? What makes them become a Republican or a Democrat? And uh, Jonathan Haidt is one of my favorite authors, and he wrote uh, the book called The Righteous Mind, Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion. He also wrote an earlier book called The Happiness Hypothesis, where he says this, My research confirms the common perception that liberals are experts in thinking about issues of victimization, equality, autonomy, and the rights of individuals, particularly those of minorities and nonconformists. Conservatives, on the other hand, are experts in thinking about loyalty to the group, respect for authority and tradition, and sacredness. When one side overwhelms the other, the results are likely to be ugly. A society without liberals would be harsh and oppressive to many individuals. A society without conservatives would lose many of the social structures and constraints that Durkheim showed are so valuable." And uh, that quote by Hyde has always been very enlightening to me. We need both liberals and conservatives uh, in our culture because they balance each other out. And you could even argue that without one, you could not have the other. Um, and, and, and yet it's not, <laughs> it can be a, a very strained uh, battle. The last thing that I want to say has to do with the church. And um, there was a book that was published by Robert Jones and a couple of other authors, a, a, a pastor up in uh, Ginghamsburg, Ohio. But the book was called Hijacked, Overcoming the Partisan Divide in Churches. And this is one of the things that they say in the book. Let's face it, we as Christians are perhaps as unsuccessful as any at being able to disagree passionately while still maintaining fellowship with those with whom we disagree. As Christians, it is true that we need to look for unity in the things essential to the faith. It is true that we need to allow diversity of opinion on things that are not essential. But regardless of whether we agree or disagree, it is a fact that we are to always model love for one another. Um, in a couple of weeks, we're going to have a, a, another guest here by the name of Alan Hilton, uh, he's going to speak at a breakfast on Saturday, and then he and I will preach on Sunday. But he's the leader of a, of a new movement called a, a House United. And Alan is a, a New Testament scholar trained at Yale, but he's given the rest of his professional career to this cause of, of, of trying to hold churches and communities of faith together. He doesn't want the polarization that is present in the culture to, to, uh, to, to ruin 
uh, churches. And he believes that it's important that we maintain churches where people obviously have different politics, disagree about the issues, and find a way to talk about it civilly. So I put that out there as something that's going to happen in a few weeks. But um, today I was just sitting, and in, 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 uh, to be honest with you, I f- sometimes find myself with more questions than answers. And I'm going to ask some questions, and I'm going to introduce John Gear and let him talk. I didn't say he'd answer these questions, but he is going to talk. And here's some of the questions that are on my mind uh, at this time right now. Will the polarization that is present in our culture continue to bleed over into churches, leaving us with only liberal and conservative congregations? We already see a lot of that within Christianity, so what is to keep that from happening in the future? When it comes to political candidates, should issues of character transcend partisanship? Are there two Americas that have emerged? I remind you of John Edwards' presidential campaign years ago where he talked about two Americas, um, one for the well-educated, connected elite, another for the hardworking, blue-collar folks who feel like they've been left behind. What does it mean to talk to someone with whom you disagree, to actually listen to them and not feel as though you must convince them that you are right or why you are right? Has the digital age only amplified a strong partisanship that has always been present? Has it simply provided a convenient platform to amplify our differences? Is there any place that people can turn nowadays to find an objective reporting of the news without bias, without spin, without interpretation. What is the basic platform of the Democratic Party at this point? Will it embrace the concept of democratic socialism and what is democratic socialism? What will the Republican Party look like after Donald Trump? Can the church be a place that tries to help set the tone for civility in our culture? What are the basic factors that lead a person to hold their ideology? And then lastly, will the fall midterm elections be a referendum on Donald Trump's presidency or will his influence and endorsement get new candidates elected and perhaps nobody can see uh, that coming or that happening? Those are some of the questions that I think about. I'm sure you could add questions to the list. And um, and I don't always have uh, answers to those questions, but I like to, uh, to discuss them. Um, John Gere has been a friend of Woodmont for many years. He's a distinguished professor of political science at Vanderbilt. He's also a uh, vice chancellor. Um, that's right, a vice chancellor. Oh, you're not. You were a vice chancellor. A dean. He's a dean at Vanderbilt. Okay, so do I. Um, but he's spoken to us many times before, and uh, we're glad to have him back tonight. So join me in welcoming uh, Dr. John Gere. Who cares? Well, thank you, Clay, and thanks for the chance to come back and and chat. Is people able to hear? Is the mic? I assume the mic's on. Is every mic clear enough? Okay, great. Um, Well, let me just make it clear that I'm probably not going to answer any of the questions he just uh, (laughs) just raised. Maybe the last one about the referendum on Trump. What I want to try to do is talk about the midterm elections. First of all, set the context briefly, then talk about there's about three pretty compelling theories that explain what happens in midterm elections, then take those theories and figure out which way it probably favors, whether the the Democrats or the Republicans, um, offer up a few guesses here or there, and then talk about the Tennessee races themselves, uh, because for the first time since 2006, we actually have competitive statewide races. We really haven't had that for a while. And regardless of whether you're a Democrat or Republican, having competition, if you take capitalism seriously at least, is probably a good thing. So let's set the context. One of the regularities of American politics, and it's not, a, it's not a completely the case, but it is a very regular pattern, that the president's party loses seats in the midterm elections. In fact, since uh, 1932, the average has been the loss of 30 seats. That's the average. It has ranged from as high as, let me just make sure I get this right, I think it was 71 in 1938, a loss of 71 seats. Uh, in 2010, the Democrats lost 63 seats. I mean, huge amounts of seat loss can happen. There have been three exceptions. Uh, following 9-11, the 2002 elections, you saw small gains by the Republicans, even though Bush was in the uh, 
White House. Following the impeachment of Clinton, the, Clinton, the Democrats actually gained seats, and that was in part the republic's reaction against the impeachment process that the Republicans pursued. And then finally, 1934, because FDR had turned around the economy, there was a small gain. But those are the exceptions. The rule is that the president's party loses about 30 seats in the House of Representatives. And if indeed 23 seats flip to the Democrats, the Democrats will control the House of Representatives. So if the average is any predictor, which of course it's, it's a very crude predictor, the Rep Democrats may well be able to take the House. You may ask about the Senate. The Senate is far less predictable. And the reason the Senate is far less predictable is the Senate is a product of only one third of the seats are up in any particular midterm election. So you don't have the full Senate up like you do the full House. And that really the Senate is a product of the six, uh, six years prior because you have six year terms. So what's going on in 2018 was really shaped by 2012. And 2012 was a decent democratic year when Barack Obama won his re-election. So that the Democrats are vulnerable this year. They have a lot of seats, much more in play than the Republicans. And those seats happen to be in a lot of states that Donald Trump won. So that you have people like uh, Manchin in West Virginia, Tester in, in Montana. They face tough battles and they face tough battles as Democrats within Trump country, um, at least based on the 2016 election. So that's kind of the context that's, that's going on. Well, I, and I'll talk a little bit about how it may all work out. But let's talk about some theories about midterm elections, because you have this consistent empirical pattern where the president's party loses seats. So what are the explanations? Well, one, Clay's already kind of hinted at, that it's basically a referendum on the president's party. And that referendum tends to go badly the first time because the public is in, uh, seeks change and so that you've got um, a referendum account. And basically the referendum is measured by two variables. One, the state of the economy, how well the economy is doing, and then the popularity of the president. And those two things you might imagine are, co are often correlated. But for example, in, t in 1990, uh, excuse me, 1982, Ronald Reagan was overseeing a very weak economy. He wasn't very popular. He was not yet the great communicator that he came to become. And the Republicans lost, I think, about 26 seats. I'm not even sure I got that right. Yep, 26 seats. And so that was a referendum. There was a referendum against Bill Clinton in 1994 where the Dem Republicans took the control of the House for the first time basically in a generation since the 1950s. So that's often a case, and that makes sense that basically the public, the president's a visible figure, that the president's party gets credit for good things, gets credit for bad things, and so as oftentimes presidents get off to what, given this pattern, seems to be weak starts, that, that happens. And so it's the economy and popularity. That's one theory. The second theory, which is actually, a, 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 I think, a very clever theory, and in fact has a lot of empirical uh, validity, is what's called the strategic politician theory that basically what happens in midterm elections isn't decided by the context today, but it's decided by the decisions of politicians to run or not to run for office in the, basically a year prior. Because if you decide you want to run for Congress or you want to run for Senate, you make that decision about a year out at least because you need to get your campaign organized, you need to raise money. And so what you do is you try to figure out the conditions and these politicians know that the president's party tends to lose, and so the, the best candidates who are on the, let's say on the Republican side in this case, because Trump is president, they choose not to run. Um, and to give you a flip side of it, I can guarantee you that Carl Dean would not have run for governor if in fact Hillary Clinton had been elected president, because he knew that the midterm elections this time would have gone very much against the Democrats if Hillary Clinton was president. And he, didn't, he already faced a stiff Republican tide in the state to begin with, and it would have been exacerbated by that midterm pattern. So his strategic decision to run was based partly on what he thought might be roughly favorable conditions, or at least more favorable conditions for, for a Democrat. And you also, not just the decision to run or not, but the decision to retire or not. So you have seen a massive number of retirements on the Republican side because they think this election was going to be bad and they made that decision a year ago. And so then these decisions affect the outcome because there's a very simple hypothesis out there that good candidates beat bad candidates. 
So if you cannot recruit good candidates to run, you're going to create a self-fulfilling prophecy. And that certainly we've seen that true in the state of Tennessee, where the Tennessee Democratic Party has had a hard time recruiting quality candidates. And certain individuals are working really hard just to get better candidates to run. So individuals like Lisa Quigley, who's the chief of staff for, for Congressman Cooper, she's worked very hard at trying to get quality candidates because that makes a huge difference. Um, and that, and that, so these strategic calculations a year out shape the outcome. The final theory that's worth talking about is something that's called surge and decline. And it's an interesting theory in the sense that Donald Trump won the presidency in 2016, and so that was in part based on a surge of voters that really liked him. And that there's two types of voters in this theory. There are core voters who turn out in every single election, and then there are peripheral voters who turn out only in high stimulus elections. And those high stimulus elections are for example, a presidential election. So you have a whole bunch of people turning out, and in this case, turning out for Trump, and they shape the election outcome. But then in a midterm election, Trump isn't on the ballot. It isn't a high stimulus election. It's a low stimulus election. Turnout drops dramatically in midterm elections compared to presidential elections. We know that that pattern, it drops from about 55, depending on how you want to measure it, but about 55, 60% of presidential elections to about 40% in midterm. So there's this big drop and the periphery drops off. And so the reason why midterm elections are so harsh on the president's party is all those peripheral voters that voted in the presidential election stay at home. And so you're only left with the core and that leads to a, an electorate that's much more favorable to the out party. So you have a surge of turnout in presidential elections, you have a decline of turnout in midterm elections and that shapes the, the outcome. All three of these theories have at least credibility on the face of it. There is plenty of empirical evidence to support the, the three of them in a variety of different, uh, different ways. Probably at the end, it's a little bit of everything. That is the economy matters, the popularity of the president matters, strategic decisions by politicians matter. And then there is this differential turnout, which we'll talk a little bit more about, because it's not clear to me how the surge and decline is gonna work in 2018. Um, and that's one of the uncertainties of this race. So given these theories, what should we expect for 2018? Is it an election that's going to continue the pattern that the president's party loses seats? Or is it one that might in fact allow Trump's party, the Republicans, to gain some seats? Of course, gaining seats is, is really hard, but what the Republicans want to avoid is that 23 seat loss. They want to make sure that it's less than that so they can keep control of the House of Representatives. Because if the Democrats get control of the House of Representatives, Trump faces a very different kind of political environment. So where do things stand? Well, first of all, the economy is doing well by most statistics. And so you might say that counts for the Republicans. And I think based on GDP and unemployment and stuff, it certainly does. Um, only recently have we begun to see income growth among the middle and the working class, and so whether that's percolated down to those folks isn't clear. So one could argue that the economy is doing well for the people who are well off, getting back to this kind of polarization theme that Clay talked about, or maybe just cite, look, the economy is doing well. And certainly compared to 2008, nine through maybe 2014, the economy is doing a lot better. So overall, you gotta count that as a plus for the Republicans. Well, what about presidential popularity? That's a minus for the Republicans. Um, Trump's popularity is pretty low. Uh, right now, it depends on how you measure it, but it's hovering around 40%. Of course, it's a very different story because you have to sort it out by party. Democrats have no use for Trump. We know that, you know, five, six percent approve of his job. Republicans still are behind the president. There's no, we do not see any erosion of support among Republicans. Uh, at this point, even with some of the recent revelations tied to Manafort and um, I'm blanking on the, on the lawyer, the fixed Cohen. Co co so even with that, the Republicans are still with him. We do see among independents in the last two weeks a shift down to, to, from Trump. That is, there's more and more disapproval of Trump. Um, so his popularity is a problem for him. Um, overall, but it really the key group here is we, the Democrats, Republicans aren't going to move very much, but it's the independents. And because they're independents, they could move, they could start moving more favorably towards Trump. You don't know for sure, but right now it's a net negative for the, for the Republicans. The strategic politician hypothesis is a huge plus for the Democrats. 
Lots of Republicans retired, and recruiting candidates was harder for the Republican Party across the country than it was for the Democrats. There was a belief that this could be a big Democratic year, and so that politician who's really ambitious thought, you know, I'm going to wait to 2020, or I'm going to wait to 2022 before I seek this office. I'm just going to be patient, or just retire and get, the, get, get out of Dodge while the getting is good. So that's a plus for the Democrats. Surge and decline. This is the one that gives me the most pause. And the reason for that is that, yeah, there was a surge of turnout that helped Trump, especially in a set of Midwestern states that had a lot of working class folks that hadn't voted for a while. And so the theory is that those people will drop out. But that's conventional wisdom. And conventional wisdom does not do us a lot of good when we talk about Donald Trump. It's just true. Does he, in fact, keep those people turning out? Um, does the Supreme Court pick get them activated? Does the fear that there would be unending investigations of the Democrats control the House of Representatives, will that give the Trumpers, so to speak, reason to turn out? Maybe. We don't know. Um, at the same time, Donald Trump's actions have given lots of people on the left, so to speak, on the Democratic side, reasons to vote because they are angry about the process and angry about what he has done. So it's possible that those turn out in record numbers and therefore provide a big boost to the Democrats. And we might see a seat loss as large as you know, 50 or so is possible. I don't think it's possible to get it much larger than that. And that would require a huge blue wave, which again, is possible. People just don't, you know, we're not very good at predicting right now and anticipating who all is going to vote. And I can talk about a little bit about that. So overall, you'd have to say 2018 structurally favors the Democrats. But there's enough uncertainty out there that you wouldn't want to just say for sure. Um, you know, when, you, when 1994 was coming, 2010, People thought it was going to be a bad year for the Democrats, but it turned out to be a lot worse than they anticipated. And so, you know, it's, we have these forces, but sometimes we were not able to anticipate the extent of the wave that'll happen. So what's the best guess? Well, as I've just suggested, the best guess is that the House does go Democratic. Um, there are a lot of vulnerable Republicans out there, and what we've seen in the handful of test districts, like what happened in Pennsylvania, suggests that the Democrats probably will be able to, to win the House back. There's also some cases which don't get talked enough about. There was a, a, a recent race, House race, to fill a seat in Arizona, heavily Republican district. Trump won by like 30, 35 points, and the Republican held on by three points. So people report the fact that the Republican won, which is true, but barely. And so as a result, that's again another sign that there is a lot of you know, support out there for Democratic candidates. The, the Senate is just harder to predict. Um, it probably stay, most conventional wisdom that the Republicans uh, will keep the Senate because they have so few seats to protect and the Democrats have so many seats. Obviously here in our own home state is a huge opportunity for a Democratic pickup uh, because of Phil Bredesen's candidacy and Bob Corker's decision to step down. Um, we'll see how that how that plays out. A couple of things to keep in mind about Senate elections, and probably true for House elections, is that we could have a wave election, and it kind of plays off in the surge and decline, that basically a whole bunch of voters come out because they're motivated by the same thing, and let's say they're motivated to vote against Trump and they vote for the Democrats, that right now we have, I think it's like 10 toss-up, clear toss-ups in the Senate. Those toss-ups, you might say, well, it's going to be like a coin flip. So you're going to have five Democrats, five Republicans, and therefore there's no way the Republicans lose the Senate. That's a plausible guess. But in fact, because of these surges that take place in elections, it's not likely to be 50-50. It's more likely to be 8 to 2, 9 to 1, 7 to 3, that one party, the party that's favored by turnout, does better. Um, and so as a result, it's possible there is a path forward for the Democrats to win the Senate. Obviously have to pick up the seat here, have to pick up the seat in Arizona. Um, and to make this all the more complicated, that polling right now is, is in my opinion, having a heck of a time figuring out who the voters are. Uh, because the one problem that we had in 2016 
is that the poll, the national polls did a perfectly good job. They, predict, they thought that Clinton would win by two points. This, this, and in fact, she won by two percentage points. But there were a set of state polls that did a horrible job. I mean, if you think about that last, the, as the election was coming to an end, there was a huge amount of attention spent by both candidates in Ohio. Ohio was a battleground state. It was not a battleground state. Trump beat Clinton by eight points. States that turned out to be battleground, like Wisconsin, wasn't, wasn't viewed as going to be competitive. It was sure Democratic. And so they got all these things wrong because they misjudged who was going to vote. Um, and the reason they misjudged is that they didn't, basically it looks like in retrospect, they didn't wait on education. That normally uh, the educated, the, the effects that education has versus well-educated versus poorly educated people didn't really matter very much. But in this election, it turned out to matter, partly because Trump was tapping into a set of people who weren't particularly educated and hadn't voted before, and that changed the calculus. Um, and if that continues, that's a problem. Or if, in fact, there's some new mechanism that's getting people to turn out, it makes me very, very concerned about how these data that are predicting close elections. Um, you know, if, we, if you see a poll, and we'll talk about the Tennessee races, but let's say you see a poll. There was a poll recently, Fox News poll, that had Bill Lee up by 20 points over Carl Dean. That's just a crock. I mean, that's just terrible polling. I mean, even the, even the Bill Lee campaign was laughing. Mean, I have no members of it. They were just laughing. They said the only th they don't like that poll because it's like people get lazy, don't think that, you know, think that Bill Lee's so far ahead. He is not 20 points ahead. I um, mean, he's probably about 10 points ahead. Um, and so the, you've got to be really careful about that. In fact, in general, you know, we can talk a little bit about, about polls, but you've got, you know, and I'm happy to, but it's, you've got to be nervous about them because they make assumptions about turnout that we just don't know for sure. And the Trump phenomenon has changed our calculations in ways. And of course, what pollsters want to do, it's like generals. You know, you fight the last war re in the next war, and you, you bring old technology, and you have to, it's the generals that adjust to the new context that are successful. Well, pollsters will say, oh, well, we learned all these lessons in 2016, assuming that the conditions of 2016 apply to 2018. Maybe, maybe not. So you've got to be really careful. In fact, my colleague and I who run the Vanderbilt poll, we are debating long and hard about whether to do a poll before the election because any poll that, predict, that says that, you know, Bredesen's way ahead or Blackburn's way ahead is probably flawed. Um, but then we'll have a poll that, let's say, gives Bredesen a two-point lead. Despite all our pleadings with the media, all our begging to say, look, this is a tie, they will run a headline that says Phil Bredesen's ahead. I don't know how to fix that, except maybe not to run a poll, um, which, again, you know, I don't know how you, want to, how you want to deal with it. So part of this problem is the news media themselves aren't necessarily covering polls very effectively, and they've got, you know, there's big standard error, there's big margins of error. Every poll has, you know, plus or minus three. Well, it's probably more like plus or minus six right now. And so if you get a poll that says, you know, somebody's up by six points, that doesn't mean much. It may be they're ahead, but boy, it's not a sure thing. So let's talk a little bit about the Tennessee races. Well, first of all, I mean, I think it's absolutely fascinating how certain um, narratives get out there. So when Phil Bredesen announced his candidacy, I probably spent easily three to four hours with various members of the national press trying to convince them that Bredesen had a chance. They said, there's no way Bredesen can win. It's a, it's a Rock River Republican state. Any Republican will win. And I said, no, that's not true. I said, first of all, the state has a bit more of a pragmatic streak than you think, that the Democrats really haven't put forward a candidate of any quality since Harold Ford and Phil Bredesen 2006. Um, we haven't had a competitive statewide race. And so you know, and remember, like, for example, Bill Haslam, when he ran for re-election in 2014, do any of you remember who, who was the Democratic nominee? Charlie Brown. Literally, the name Charlie Brown. Okay, I tease the governor from time to time about that. I mean, you know, of course he won re-election. Um, he, he, he snagged that football away from Charlie Brown. Um, and so... The Democrats have just not put forward any candidates. And if you start trying to remember who the Democrats were that ran in those various statewide races, you're going to struggle. 
Um, so you have that, so that the vote has been exaggerated. Um, and then, of course, Harold Ford, who was a very successful candidate, in my opinion, and very talented, he bolts to New York. So we lose that particular political talent, as the, de the Democrats do. So you've got that problem. You have a state that's a little bit more moderate. And then you have a candidate, Phil Bredesen, who really rises above party in the sense that he governed in a way that was a problem solver, that he probably will get a decent amount of Republican support, and he actually has a chance. And slowly but surely, they bought into it, and now the, they know that it's a close race. Um, and you, know, you wouldn't want to lay down a huge amount of money, but we'll talk a little bit about that, but this is a chance to, to show the, the, the path forward for Democrats. Um, and how is this race playing out right now? Well, I think, you know, the CNN poll, uh, the Marist poll are probably better quality polls than the Fox poll. Um, I know from own, own internal polling of the candidates that probably Bredesen has a five-ish point lead. Could be as much as seven, might be as low as three, but you put all those things together, Bredesen probably has a lead. Now, does that mean he'll hold that lead? No, because there's a couple of things that, that go on. First of all, the campaign is gonna crank up in intensity. We're already, I'm sure many times when you're turning on the TV, you're watching lots of ads. It's only gonna get worse. Um, both sides do not lack for money. And so they're going to be firing back and forward. And really what's interesting about this race, besides the fact that it's competitive and matters nationally, et cetera, is that you really have candidates with two different visions about how to run. Marsha Blackburn wants to run as kind of the heir of Donald Trump. She wants to hug Donald Trump. She wants to invoke his name. She even, in fact, has an ad where Trump makes fun of Bredesen. So she's tying herself to, to Trump and really nationalizing the race. She wants to nationalize this race to be, in a sense, going back to one of those theories, in a sense, is a referendum on Trump. And she believes in her calculations, or at least her people believe, that if you have a referendum on Trump in this state, that Trump wins that referendum. Maybe. But the problem is that Trump's popularity is probably not much above 50% in the state right now. It's been in the low 50s for the last couple of polls, and given recent events like Manafort, et cetera, it may be just a little bit down. So that's a bit of a gamble on her part. But it's also true that, you know, how do Tennesseans react to that as the, as the basis by which they're going to vote for the next Senate? And then you contrast that with Phil Bredesen's strategy. Bredesen's strategy is not a, strat a national strategy. It is a Tennessee strategy. He wants to talk about local problems. He, he has never, I've never heard him issue the word Democrat once in any campaign event that he's had, and he ad, doesn't talk about that. He talks about being a problem solver, he even had an ad where he said, I'll oppose Trump when he's against Tennessee, and I'll vote for Trump, support him when he's for Tennessee. So he's been very careful about that, um, and his ads have been pretty effective. In fact, you know, he, his tagline at the end, I'm applying for the job, I think, is a really good tagline. Um, and he's engaged in this campaign. He's writing most of his own material. He's doing a lot of the work on trying to figure out the ad. So these messages are coming from him. They're not coming from consultants, and that always makes them much more genuine. But you really do have these two competing models. And the question is, do those Republicans right now that are prepared to defect, do they come home to, to Blackburn or do they stay with Bredesen? And that's the big question. And so you could, in fact, over the next six to seven weeks as we approach the election, you could see some conservatives coming back home to, to Blackburn as she reminds them about what Bredesen would be as a Democrat. And that's totally fair and plausible. I think that because Bredesen's so, so well known in the state, that that's a little bit of a harder sell. Um, but it's possible. And that's really will be the battle. Now, they have some debates coming up. I mean, it'll be interesting to see how that plays. Given the kind of decline of the local media, et cetera, I don't expect there'd be, unless there's some huge event that unfolds uh, in, a, in one of the debates, that they probably won't shape things. Um, you know, they'll, they'll stick to their messages. They won't, you won't see much out of those debates and you already see in their ads and in the speeches, et cetera. So it'll be an interesting, interesting test. I certainly know that national Republicans, people who are in the leadership of the Republican Party, are very nervous about this race. They think there's a good chance they'll, they'll lose the race. Um, but again, it's not a sure thing. And if you get back to that surge stuff, 
you know, maybe, maybe, it's, maybe there's more Trump support out there than we think, and Trump is right about that, and all of a sudden it pushes Blackburn to a win. Or that blue wave comes and it actually turns out not to be so close, that Bredesen wins by six or seven points. All of that is quite possible. Um, if you put your money down right now, I wouldn't put a lot, but I'd put it on Bredesen, um, especially if it was Clay's money. Um, <laughs> So Lee and Carl, well, first of all, I thought the de Republican primary was absolutely fascinating on the gubernatorial side. Um, you know, I always, I, I'd been arguing to people for a long time that I thought Lee had a shot because Lee was running the campaign that he was comfortable with. Um, he's obviously an individual of faith. I've not heard anybody say something negative about him as a person. I mean, in fact, even Carl Dean will you know, say, look, I respect this guy. I like this guy. Um, so he has that going for him. He's not running a very issue-based campaign, but he doesn't need to. He's running a campaign he's comfortable with. He has a personal narrative that's compelling. And he let basically Black and Boyd beat each other up, and he just became the alternative. Um, and it's, it's, it's interesting. If, if Randy Boyd had run the campaign that he should have, the one that he would be comfortable with, I think it would have been a very different kind of race. Um, but, you know, Lee also had the benefit of having some of the best ad people, a guy named Fred Davis behind him, and also consultants, and they seem to be continuing that way. And if you notice, the, the notice of the difference in tone between the gubernatorial campaign and the senatorial campaign, I mean, you know, Carl's criticizing Lee a couple of times in over, Medi over Medicaid expansion, but again, it's, the, it's very soft kind of criticism, and probably criticism that Lee thinks is totally fair because they do disagree on Medicaid, Medicaid expansion. And I would say that I give Carl Dean high marks as well. He is running the campaign he's comfortable with as well. It may not be a winning campaign for this particular race, but he's doing the kind of things he wants. He's wrapped his mind around the campaign. He's gotten better on the stump. Um, his ads are pretty good. They, they deliver what they what want. It's actually, I, I find this race, um, kind of one that isn't so polarizing. That really, you know, if, if you step back and think about it, either one of these individuals are qualified to be governor and the state would be in fine hands. And that's kind of a comforting feeling. You don't have that feeling for the Blackburn uh, Bredesen race because there are high stakes and there's much more polarization. Depending on which side of the fence you're on, you feel there's higher stakes. Um, but, I, but I think that'll go. I do think there's one twist that actually probably helps Phil in this race. So we know that partisanship drives a lot of choices. Republicans vote for Republicans, Democrats vote for Democrats, that's kind of obvious. And what we have in, in, in partisanship is a psychological process, okay? That is that you are thinking of yourself, you identify yourself as a Democrat, or you identify yourself as a Republican. What that does is basically it's like a pair of glasses where if you're a Republican, when the light comes in, it bends one way, and if you're a Democrat, the light bends in another way, that you perceive things differently. You know, I don't know how many of you would you know, have thought to yourself, how can somebody support, let's just play it part, be partisan for a second, how can someone support Donald Trump? He lies all the time. That's not a ridiculous statement to make, but that's a statement Democrats make. But Republicans are interpreting that same set of information in a very different way. So we know that partisanship is there. And there's a process called cognitive dissonance, where basically if you vote against your party, you really need to have a lot of good reasons to do it because it, it sits with you, it bothers you. It bothers you. It's, like, it's like rooting for a sports team. I mean, I was, t I was dealing with some, some consultants today that they were paying them a lot of money and they showed up with orange pens. I said, really? I'm paying you this amount of money and you show up with orange pens? And they realized and they started panicking. I was teasing, not completely, okay? <laughs> but I was teasing. So there's a, you know, there is that psychological process. I grew up in New York City, outside of New York City. I was a diehard Mets fan, diehard Jets fan. I hate the Yankees, I hate them. Um, even though they have great players and they've won, and my team has not won very much. But I stand by them um, because I'm loyal to, you know, loyal to them. And so there's this psychological process. So if I, 
you know, and, and actually one of the things I follow fantasy, I play fantasy football, that screws around with your, your loyalties because I have Deshaun Watson, who was a quarterback for the Texans, playing against the Titans this last weekend. I'm a huge Titans fan, but there I am, you know, trying to fight it all. Um, and it's just part of it. So how this plays out for this particular race, I believe that if you take what we might call a Haslam Republican, who is you know, conservative on, on social issues, conservative on economic issues, but not a firebrand, not necessarily totally comfortable with the kind of politics that Blackburn engages in, that they can go into the voting booth, vote for Lee and vote for Bredesen and come out thinking they've fulfilled their partisanship, that they haven't run orthogonal to it. Now, for those, that's where Carl Dean faces a problem because if, he's run, if, he get, if it requires somebody to vote for both Bredesen and for Dean, who's a Republican, and that's hard. That's just a higher hurdle. Um, and it would have been a really interesting dynamic if, in fact, Black had been the nominee as opposed to, to, um, to uh, Lee, because it would have been a test to see. You have, you have Republicans who, again, are, let's say, out of the Bill Haslam school or the Howard Baker school or whatever you want to term it, could they vote for against both Black and Blackburn? That would have been it. Would have been interesting to see. Probably would have made a. I mean, Carl, I think would have been very competitive against Black, but you know she had high negatives and stuff that showed up in the primary itself. But so I think that cognitive dissidents. I don't think Republicans will be bothered by it. And there's enough enough people I've talked to, who I believe that they probably will not feel as much of a need to come home because when they go in that polling booth the Bredesen-Lee combination probably fulfills uh, their partisanship. But we'll see. Um, and it'll be really an interesting test for a variety of reasons because I've been arguing for a long time that Tennessee's a bit more moderate than you think. And certainly Diane Black's defeat at the hands of Bill Lee is kind of a test of that. But the real test is under these conditions, which are favorable overall to the Democrats, can someone like Phil Bredesen win? If in the end he doesn't win, that's probably a sign that you have a state's just a little bit more rock rib conservative than, than some of the polling data suggests. But we'll see what happens. Bredesen could make some major mistake or some new revelation comes out or whatever. Um, but it's great, you know, I, I love elections and I love the, the strategies and the competitions behind them and trying to figure out what's going on. And this year in particular, because Tennessee is a, a competitive race, it's been fun to, to think about this particular race and how it'll play out. Um, and, you know, at this point in time, you've got to figure that Bill Lee's got a pretty good chance of, of winning, but he's still not very well known. Um, but what people do know they like. I mean, maybe a debate could cause him some problems. It's not the format he likes, and so it's possible. But again, I don't think we have the strength of the local media to cover it enough that would make a difference. Um, and Carl Dean probably comes out of this race, let's say he does lose, probably in a position to be able to run again. And so the, his career is by no means, no means over. And in some cases, you, you lay the groundwork. If you remember, Phil Bredesen lost his first statewide race and then went on to win. So those are my thoughts about midterm elections. It'll be great fun to watch it on that, uh, on that Tuesday evening. And... You know, given American politics are going on right now, we'd always say that six weeks is a long time, but in this day and age, six weeks seems like a very, very long time because who knows what could happen between now and, uh, and then, and, and we'll continue to have the, the Trump narrative no matter what. And so in some sense, it may be hard just for these cans to break through and just get any attention because our president, boy, he sucks the, room, the air out of the room with the 24-7 coverage and he loves every minute of it. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll take any questions that people have. All right. Um, so I, I, let's thank John Gear and we'll do a Q&A. I'll, uh, I'll start with one and then put your hand up and I'll bring, bring the mic to you. Um, you've, you've, you've done a lot of work and I think you have a book on uh, negative uh, ads. And so one of the takeaways from the Republican primary was that Lee ran a positive campaign. Everybody else was slowing it out, and he didn't go negative. So any thoughts on you know, how that worked for him, and, and that was in the primary, does that work in the, in the general election? Yeah, so the role of negative ads um, is something that needs a lot more thought for a variety of reasons. We, I won't get into that. But 
Primaries are different than general elections for all the obvious reasons, but in this particular case, attack politics in a two-candidate race work very different than in a three-candidate race. So when you have two, or it was four, because obviously uh, Speaker Harwell was involved as well. But if you, if let's say Clay and I run in a campaign against each other and we're attacking each other, even if he drives down my negatives, and, but I manage to drive down his negatives more, I can be able to, to win the race. And so that one-on-one -on -one competition changes it. But imagine instead you have a three-candidate race. Then all of a sudden you and I are attacking each other, lowering our negatives, and then the person who's not involved in the attacks surges. So that you have to be much more careful about attack politics and how they work. And then you interact that with the fact in a primary you don't have the anchor of partisanship. That you have Republicans competing against each other for the support of fellow Republicans. So that you don't have that basis and so they can move things around a lot more. And Lee just ran a very smart kind of race. Um, what will be interesting to see in the general election here is that because I mentioned earlier Bredesen and Blackburn have plenty of money, Dean's doesn't have as much money as, uh, as Lee does, but they st still apparently has, has enough. But by the time we're coming to the end of October, is the saturation of these ads going to just start to have no effect at all, that there's going to be so many ads that it just won't matter? And I ask, um, oh, I ask, I ran into Bredesen's campaign manager, and I said, you know, are you guys going to even be able to find airtime to buy with your money? Are you going to run out of slots available because everybody... And they, they think they won't, but that's a possibility, that the airwaves will be so saturated that it's just going to be... And at that point in time, they've got the money, so they spend it, so it's kind of like an arms race, you know, where you, spend, you buy more and more weapons because the other side is doing it, but it doesn't make, necessarily make you any more secure. It actually, in some sense, makes you more vulnerable. This may be happening um, with the Bredesen... Uh, uh, Blackburn race. And we'll be able to tell the other thing that will go on is if Blackburn believes, based on her own polling, that she continues to trail, I would expect her to turn it up. And then, then that turning it up in and of itself may turn off people, but it depends on how Bredesen responds. If he can respond in a measured fashion, he probably negates those attacks and probably comes back to hurt her. But if he responds in an effective way, it could come back to, to, be, to her benefit and cost, but we'll, we'll just have to watch how that plays out. Rich has the mic. So, uh, so John, uh, the question that I have is, you're an expert on polling, and, and I don't see, you know, it seems to be really a, an interesting science, but one of the <laughs> questions I have is, when a poll comes out favoring one candidate, one party over the other, does it actually incentivize the other party to show out and greater show up in greater numbers? And how do you figure that into your polling data? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, most most of the that's a, the hypothesis is that all of a sudden you see well, it can cut either way. So let's say there's a poll and you and I are running, and all of a sudden I'm up by five. Does that make my side so happy that they turn out, or do they become confident they don't, and your side becomes? depressed and they don't turn out or they become worried and they turn out. So you can cut it in a number of different ways. It doesn't look like polling itself affects most people's preferences and that makes sense in today's age because let's say you're a diehard Democrat and I have a poll that shows X, the, you know, the Democrats are behind her head, it's not going to make any difference, you're still going to vote for the Democrat. And so then you want to know, well, could polling results affect the independents? And it might, but one of the things about the there's not a lot of benefit of just voting for the winner if you're an independent. So there's not a lot of evidence for, for that. I think what does happen, though, and this is where the question becomes really interesting, is that it doesn't necessarily have a direct effect on the public at first, but it does affect how the news media cover things. So that, you know, despite all the claims I make, that, you know, where there's a three or four point lead by whatever candidate, that doesn't mean it's a statistical tie. They can't help themselves. So that sometimes then all of a sudden you get a, a perception that one person's a problem or not, and then, that, then they have to play defense for a while. And so that takes them off their game. And so it's possible it has a very indirect effect through the news media's coverage. So take an example. One reason why I started the Vanderbilt poll was uh, from the 2006 election. It took me a while to get all the pieces in place. But in the 2006 election, Corker and Ford were engaged in a very close race. 
and it was probably a week and a half out, so it would have been the weekend, not the weekend just before the election, but the prior weekend, I get a call from the Tennessean, and they say, we have some polling results, we want your comments on them, but we're gonna ask you to embargo the results and not share them with anybody until Sunday. So basically the Sunday before, so nine days before the election, they were producing these results. And I said, sure, send me the data. And the data showed, I think, Corker up by 12 points, and I looked at it, I said, there's no way Corker's up by 12 points. And then I looked, I had them send me the other stuff. And it turns out they oversampled East Tennessee. It wasn't intentional, whatever. They needed to weight the data differently. You always have to weight your polling data. And if you did a rough calculation based on just sorting out the three regions and the support, that in fact you got down, Harold was down by five if you weighted it in a more effective way. I could not convince the Tennessean to, to, to cover it as, as yeah, it, Corker's ahead, but to downplay the size of the lead. Couldn't do it, because of course they said, you know, Corker has massive lead. That forces Harold for five or four or five days to play defense until the next poll comes out. And guess what? The Gallup poll comes out in Friday before the election. Corker's up by three points, which is about what he won by. But it took Ford off his game for four days. Now, I am not for a moment suggesting that Harold would have won the race if it had been different, but it does change the dynamics. And so I think the bigger problem is the news media. And we see that in a, in a different form on election night and their push to predict elections. Um, my my co-conspirator, Josh Clinton, works for NBC. He's behind the curtain, so to speak. And you know, he's constantly telling, no, we cannot call that election. We cannot call that election. Um, but you know, they just they can't help themselves. And then if one calls it, then they feel the pressure to, to call it as well, even if the data don't. Supported, so I, I would, I, I think there's something to the hypothesis, but it's not the direct effect; it's indirect. If there is, and it's, again, it's going to be subtle because partisanship drives so many preferences. <laughs> Rich, you're not doing a good job. I can't let you leave here tonight without asking your observations about the uh, Judge Kavanaugh selection <laughs> process. Yeah. Um, I don't know how it'll turn out. It's going to be, it's, uh, there's so many different reactions I have to it. The, late, the last minute nature of it bothers me. Um, I think that the Republicans, the first instinct is to do a, to have some testimony, but it doesn't strike me as very thorough, so I'm not wild about that. Um, and I think that the you know the realities are that Kavanaugh's decision. I don't know whether it's true or not. Certainly, the things that people have shown, like the, the um, her comment, her her uh, confidential comments to her therapist six seven years ago, whenever it was you know, suggests there's some credibility here to it. It's certainly plausible. I mean, we're talking about 17, 18 year old males, right? So we're not, you know, so that's, that's all possible. I personally, if it's true, and I don't know that it's true at all, I, I would have advised Kavanaugh to just admit it and say, look, this happened. It happens a lot. I regret it. And I will tell you from time to time, I think about it and I'm embarrassed, but it did, it did happen. Not exactly as she claims, the memories are a little off, but basically, yes, we, you know, had a massive makeout session, whatever you want to call it, and I did get aggressive, and I, but I did, you know, but it did end. Something like that, just telling the truth. But that assumes it happened. And so if it didn't happen, he's got to do what he's, what he's done. Um, and it just, makes things, it just makes things all the more bitter. But, you know, does the Congress decide to investigate it um, or the Senate to take it? And they're in a big rush to get it done. Partly because what the, what the politics of this is, is that for the Senate races, they would love to see some senators like Tester and Manchin face a tough vote on, on Kavanaugh. And my guess is that if indeed it looks like it's good, they'll all vote for Kavanaugh and it'll be pretty lopsided. If I'm, if I'm advising Tester, yeah, I would do it. Because nobody questions, holding aside, the, if indeed he's lied, that's a big issue, okay? But his actual, prior to this result, uh, revelation, which is big besides, you know, you may not like his politics, but, you know, he's, he's qualified. Um, and that's, you know, that's going to drive it. But there's also, of course, the, you know, the way McConnell played 
and denied Obama a chance to appoint somebody. There's just is a lot of stuff going on here. And I would not have any way to predict what will finally, finally happen, except it's just going to make things all the more bitter because you know, Republicans feel like, why did Feinstein sit on it so long? That's if she doesn't question. show up to, to testify Monday, which the last uh, I've read that she's not planning to come Monday, then what will then what will that mean? I mean, we know what it will mean if they both I think it testify. Gives the, I think it gives the Republicans a little coverage just to go forward with the vote, and they'll they'll be able to get them confirmed. It'll there'll be some screaming, and I think it does have some consequences. What you know? What does it does it spur kind of suburban women to vote even more Democratic? It could. I mean, the Republicans are not in a great position right now um, because if they did have a full set of hearings, it could lead to him not being confirmed. And I, but I don't know what the underlying you know, truth is, and that's part of what's going on. And I, and I don't have any faith that the, the Trump White House is providing any solid advice here on this case because of their own track, you know, Trump is going to view it within, from his own lens is not necessarily from what's best for Kavanaugh, but we'll see. It's a tough one. Uh, in the last 30 or 40 years, why have most of our institutions of higher learning become so liberal? Well, I'm not sure that they've become more liberal. I, I think they've been pretty liberal for a long time. I, I'd have to look at the data, but um, I mean, I think that first of all, you know, the college professors on average, and I'm one of them, um, and within the ranks of college professors, I'm, you know, kind of on the right side of the scale, so to speak, within that group. But basically, they're individuals who value education and often the public support of education, that is governmental support of education, that leads them to be, to be Democrats. Um, and I don't think that, that the, the, the higher, higher ed's changed very much. I do think that the country itself has become a little bit more conservative since, for example, the 60s when you, know, you could run as a liberal and win as Lyndon Johnson did. And so what's probably happened is that the institutions of higher learning haven't changed as much as the public. Um, and I also think that one of the things that's happened in higher education is that institution institutions in general have done a bad job about communicating what faculty do. I mean, so for example, higher education is an engine for unbelievable innovation and research. It, it has major discoveries in medical health, technology, saving people's lives, huge impacts on that, huge impacts on other stuff, but the universities have not done a good job communicating those types of things. I mean, this, this country should make a huge investment in simply basic research because it pays so many dividends down the line. I mean, and the equivalent is like, for instance, the GI Bill. The GI Bill was the biggest single money maker for this country that we've ever, almost ever had because we basically gave people access to college education after they came back from World War II. It was a big government program, and guess what? Those people got education, they went out and got better jobs, and they paid more taxes the rest of their lives. It was a huge boom. And so there's certain things that the government should do, but they have to be communicated. And so we, we as an institution, Vanderbilt's trying, but you know, there are big engines of change. And so I, I think that the, where I would say higher education has fallen down is they haven't communicated effectively enough all the successes and the contributions that they can, that they can make to society. Now, are they more liberal than the average citizen? Yeah, there's no debate. No debate about that. But the military is also more conservative than the average citizens. And so that's not necessarily a thing against that institution either. So different, you know, different institutions are going to have different kind of ideological positions. But I, I would be interesting to test to see if institutions of higher education have gotten more liberal. But the elite institutions have been liberal for a while. And if, and if you take a wider swath of college educate of, of, high, of universities, let's say you include a lot of uh, state schools, of, let's say more local state schools like uh, UT Martin, compare it to UT Knoxville, I would bet the faculty probably be a little bit more conservative at UT Martin. That's a guess, but I don't, I don't have those data. But John, one of the, the Jonathan Haidt, and I can't remember who the co-author of his, the new book, The Coddling of the American Mind, mm -hmm. one of the things that he points out 
is that that, that the ratio is incredibly skewed. Oh. I mean, and and maybe maybe it has always been that way. But how do you have the how do you have a, a, a an ex- healthy exchange of ideas if everybody is in one camp or is in a version of one camp? I, I couldn't agree more. And I think that you know one of the things that if you really take the concept of inclusion seriously, you've got to be inclusive of all groups. And I would I would you know accept the point that universities have tended to be, you know, somebody who's super conservative isn't often welcome. Though it depends by field. Economists are mostly Republicans. Business, the people in the business school are mostly Republicans. If you go to our divinity school, <laughs> there's no Republicans um, <laughs> that I know of. Um, uh, well, that's not true. Actually, I know one, but he's deep in the closet. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, yeah, and it's a problem because if you, really t- if you really believe today's problems, which I do, are complex, and therefore the only way to solve a complex problem is to bring a whole bunch of different perspectives to bear. You've got to have that diversity that Height's talking about. I mean, but you, but you can embed it in a lot of different ways. So let's say we're interested in the issue of inequality. Pretty big issue. This country's really unequal. It's, it's embarrassingly unequal. So how do you fix that? Well, it's a tough problem, and you've got to tackle from a lot of perspectives. So you may want to have some economists. You might want to have some political scientists. You might want to have some sociologists, some business people. You might want to have an historian, um, an anthropologist. You could imagine all the different people. But in addition, you want to bring people to bear who maybe grew up wealthy, who grew up poor, who grew up in the rural areas, who grew up in the cities, to bring to bear these different viewpoints that are going to give you a chance to tackle this particular problem. And it's something that I'm really personally committed to because I don't think there's one answer to any problem. And the, you know, the, you know, you made the comment, and it's quite correct, that you need the liberals and conservatives to play off each other. And the same notion is that you want to have a competitive two-party system. That competition in and of itself is a healthy thing. I mean, I think one of the things that faces the, this state faces a problem is that our state legislature has no competition except within the Republican Party. It would really be healthy for the state to have a strong Democratic Party. Not from the fact that I want the state to be more liberal, but I want to have a more genuine conversation about the pros and the cons. And that's the difficulty with today's environment, is that there is not enough conversation where you can actually try to move your positions because you're you're just so dug in on one side. And of course, then you set up your your media feeds to feed your particular ideological position where, you know, in in 1970, you know, Democrats and Republicans were watching Walter Cronkite. And so there wasn't this bias in the news feed as well that causes additional additional problems. And so there's just a lot of misinformation out there on both sides that causes um, that causes difficulty. And it's and my biggest worry about the current environment isn't the polarization per se, it's that we've moved away from having an honest assessment of the evidence that would allow you to then make decisions based on that evidence. Because there are certain things we know. I mean, I, you know, personally, I just, I can't, I can't imagine why somebody would oppose changes for, on climate. The evidence is overwhelming, but even if in fact you say the evidence is only 50% chance that we should worry about this. 50% chance with our world? Imagine if somebody told you that your child only has a 50% chance of dying. Well, first, you'd want to make sure that it's 0%. You'd take whatever possibility. And so that whole debate has become political as opposed to figuring out what's going on. Mm -hmm. You you know, you think what happened in North Carolina isn't tied to climate change? I mean, it is. I mean, the size of that storm, everything like that, it's tied to it. Maybe trying to address it through policy, whatever, wouldn't solve it. Maybe not. But we can't keep going down this path, so we might as well try. Because the consequences are really disastrous if we don't. And that's just a, that's just a probability game. And so, but having that kind of evidence is critical to be able to make the right kinds of decisions. And now you know, people are questioning both sides. And this is not a conservative issue or a liberal issue. Climate change happens to be, so, so to speak, on the liberal side. But we also know lots of things that work on the conservative side that they get to, you know, the liberals will never accept that evidence base either. So that's what I really worry about is we've got to have a shared set of evidence. And that's one thing that universities, getting back to the earlier theme, they provide. They generate results. They generate findings that, in fact, can tell us what, 
you know, what might work or not. I mean, why was HCA, for example, a hugely successful corporation? Because they gathered data and could tell you if, in fact, you have a cesarean sec C-section, how long you should stay in the hospital because they had enough data to tell what the right procedures were. It wasn't based on any theory. It was based on just brute data. And we now have the ability to collect massive amounts of data. I mean, like our weather reports are much more accurate than they used to be. Why? Because we can just crush it with data. And we have this ability and we've just got to stick with the evidence. And this is something that really personally worries me that we are not letting the facts interfere with our views. <laughs> and we really should. Yeah, go ahead. I don't want to go against what you just said on data, but you made a really interesting point that I may have cited you know, a few times since hearing you speak here six, eight months ago mm -hmm. when you were kind of walking through the, the Trump election and some of the things that drove it and the discrepancies with the polls. Uh, you made a point about kind of extrapolating data based on demographics and mm -hmm. these young 20-year-olds that had landlines and that, oh, were, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. uh, th that tended to sway the polls and, and led to this perception about people at that age range and what their beliefs were. Mm -hmm. d you know, after hearing that, I, I, it gave me a little concern about polling sure. and, and the results. Are there different strategies in terms of procurement of data that are compensating for some of those flaws? Because it, you're right. I mean, we've got more data than we've ever right. could, could ever imagine, but some of it is fundamentally flawed in the way we're able to capture it. And one of that is one of those reasons is the well, telephonic system. That's right. Absolutely. I mean, you can't, you know, just having, you know, there was an old survey that was done uh, in the 19, from the 1936 election that had a million data points. And it was predicting Alf Landon to win. And Alf Landon, you don't know the name, and very few of you know, but he got killed by Franklin Roosevelt. They've had the election completely wrong, but they had a lot of data. So you do have to make sure you have what we might, let's just settle, is representative data. So then you go back and talking about polling, is it doesn't matter how you do your polling, whether you do in-person interviews, you do telephone interviews, you do internet interviews, they all have certain kinds of biases. And so the key is to then try to do your weighting. And every poll has to be weighted. And that's where you have, you, you, you know, you have your science, but you also have to have some art involved in that. And really what the key thing is, in my opinion, about polling at this point in time, is to be absolutely transparent about what you've done so that somebody like yourself can say, okay, well, I don't buy that, or you do buy it, but you can at least figure out what's going on. And so one of the things that Vanderbilt Poll, we're one of the founding members of the, of the American Association for Public Opinion Researchers Transparency Initiative, where we make everything uh, known how we did our weighting. Just because you have to, because you might choose reasonably so to say that's probably not a good way to go. So, and, and the weighting decisions make a difference. Take example, uh, New Hampshire in the 2016 election. I don't think I mentioned this, it's something I've learned recently. Uh, the polls prior to the vote had Hillary Clinton up by 14 points. Easy win. She wins by 300 votes. Wow, what the heck? That, and that's, you know, that's a huge difference in polling. So what's going on? Well, it turned out that they weren't weighting their poll by education, that if you actually weighted by educational attainment, it all of a sudden moved to a two-point lead by Hillary Clinton. So that you, everybody has to engage in weighting, because if you just do phone calls, you tend to get, um, you get a lot of senior citizens answering it. Women tend to answer it more. The teenager, 18-year-old um, who doesn't have a cell phone, only answers on the landline, is in fact a very weird dude. And we don't want to really rely on that at all. Um, you know, it really is. You just think about it. There's some 18-year-old who's waiting for the cell landline to ring and answers it and then is willing to do 20-minute interview. I mean, that's, you know, not a, good, it's not, not a good sample. No, no. And so you have to figure out how to deal with that. And, and, and that's why, you know, you, you talk about the science of poll, not that you did, but you might talk about the science of polling. And there is a really strong science behind it, but there's inevitably an art to it as well. And so you've got to figure out what you know, makes sense or not. I mean, so for example, it doesn't make sense to think that Lee's up by 20. That just doesn't, isn't plausible. Um, is it plausible that Marsha Blackburn's up by three? Yeah, that's plausible. Um, is it plausible that Phil Bredesen's up by 15? No, it's not. And so you also have to have, does it, does it pass the sniff test as far as being reasonably credible? So for example, we, 
I got a call, MTSU did a poll that had Haslam's popularity in the low 50s. And I, you know, I would not comment on it because it would sound like I'm trashing uh, the poll. And I want MTSU's poll to do really well. It's not credible to be 52%. The guy just is, uh, people like the governor. And there's no event that's happened that would drive him from the mid 60s to 52. But they produced those results and treated them as facts and tried to tout them. And of course their own private polling that is Haslam's polling showing him still in the mid 60s. We did a poll about a month later showed him in the mid 60s. So when you get results that don't make sense, you've just gotta be brave enough to bury them or to show them and say, look, we don't buy this result for these kinds of reasons. Um, and, and that's where it becomes more of an art. And there's just certain, certain things you get used to with polling that you, know, you, you just have to rely on. And they, for example, if all of a sudden we have a poll that showed the Democrats and Republicans in even numbers, we know we've screwed up. Now, your tempting might say, oh, look, at the Tennessee's turning blue. No, no, it's not. But it's, you, know, you, could get, so you have to be careful about that. Um, and the key thing at this point in time is just to be as transparent as possible. Um, and so that a lot of these polls, if you w read what they say, like there was a poll, what was it, what's it? Emerson, oh my God. I don't know what the heck they do. I mean, you read how they do their poll. I don't know what they do. It could be completely legitimate. But there's just a bunch of babble about what they're saying. I have no idea. So I don't trust that at all. Maris poll is pretty good. CNN poll is fine. Um, the Fox News poll, e even, even the Lee people admitted they'd oversampled Republicans. Um, and so, but, that, but that oversample may not actually have been the case. Maybe they waited it along that way because you also have to decide who's the likely voters and stuff like that. It's, it's not easy. And so at the end of the day, just tell people what you've got and then they can kind of make their decisions and then have a story behind if all of a sudden the numbers change dramatically, you know, what's the reason? So that's why, you know, if all of a sudden Bredesen's up by 15, there's no event. But if all of a sudden, let's say there's some scandal that hits Blackburn and then there's a poll out, okay, that's at least a story that's possible. Um, and one of the things that I think is important is that if data really matter and we have to pay attention to it. You have to pay attention to the quality of its collection. I couldn't agree more. But you also have to make sure that you've got a story behind it too. That it, you, know, you can't just let data itself drive everything. You've got to have a narrative and you have to put it in context. And so, but if you do, but if you do away with data, then you let just the context drive and it's a, it's a problem. But it's, you know, there's science, even, even the hardest core science still requires, um, let's say, the humanist touch, if you will. Hi, let, me, let me ask one last thing. Alan, did you have one? I just had a curious question because your, your comment was we need to have people to get together and talk. And That's right. And, and agree on the share and agree on data. We certainly aren't having any of that going on in Washington. No, I agree. Is there ever going to be a day that gets back to that? You have to believe that there will be. I um, mean, you know, it, at some point there'll be some leader, there'll be somebody who will, who will connect into politics and connect into people and give people that right. I, that's my optimistic reading. You know, there's been, there have been times in American history where we've been about as polarized. Prior to the Civil War, late 1800s, there's some evidence that we've been very similar kinds of polarization. Um, there was a long time getting back to this issue of accurate data that people, some measures we had suggested the 30s weren't polarized which never made any sense to me because of course they were polarized. FDR was a big, big polarizing figure. They've done some re-estimates and in fact found, you know, found pol you know, more polarization. So I think, yeah, it could, it could come back. Um, it'll have to be in the electoral interests of people. It'll be really interesting to see what happens. You know, the, the Republicans have put all their money behind Trump in some sense, and if, let's say that you know, Trump continues to have the economy grow, he gets through all these crises or whatever, that could be a very good bet. But let's say it, uh, the wheels come off the wagon, that Mueller has, a, has the smoky gun. I No, I don't think he does, but let's just assume he does. And then all of a sudden the Republicans get trounced. Then they'll be tacking back pretty quickly. And so some of the polarization could ease pretty quickly. But right now they're putting their money on Trump and that's led to more polarization. But there was plenty of polarization under Obama. And if you go back in time, there was plenty of polarization under Roosevelt as well. I mean, the 1940s, I mean, when, when President Roosevelt passed away in April 12th of 1945, there were a lot of organizations that threw parties. I mean, you know, this is the guy who led us through 12 years in, in a way that, 
you wouldn't think there, you know, I can why people disagree, but you know, there has been polarization in the past and we've gotten through it. So John, two, two things. Can you comment on the evangelical embrace of Trump? Is it simply, in the, in the last election, was it simply the lesser of two evils from their perspective? And the last question is you've done predictions over the years. Do you want to make uh, any predictions on the Tennessee races for the fall? We'll stop after that. Sure. Um, you know, I think that the evangelical embrace of, of Trump was in part a reaction against Clinton. And so it wasn't so much, they were willing to take a gamble on Trump. And right now, you know, you could say, how do they, how do they support this guy with all these moral uh, problems that are pretty visible? But at the same time, he may be putting people on the court that's going to shape policy in a way that many of the evangelical community, and obviously the evangelical community is not uniform. But so I think that's probably, you know, but again, it's, you know, it's, I don't think they're wild about it, but they're willing to, to live with it because, you know, the court, at this point in time, because the court could actually take the kind of conservative cast that they want. Um, as far as the predictions, you know, I'd still stand by Bredesen wins narrowly um, and, you know, Lee probably wins by 10-ish. But we'll, but we'll see. It's still lots to, to go and, you know, I, and really what I hope, because one of the things that's going on in Tennessee that's at this point in time getting to be embarrassing is our turnout is horrible. Cool. You know, we're like 47th or 48th. We need to just increase that regardless of where who people vote for. We just need people to vote. Um, and I really do at the end of the day, and I've said this in prior settings here, is that, you know, people say, well, how are we going to get Trump? Look, if you really, if people think Trump needs to go, that has to be done through the ballot box. I don't think you're going to get it through impeachment or anything like that. You're going to have to do it. And so the first step, if you really believe that, is to get turnout for the Democrats in 2018. If that doesn't happen and the Republicans have that surge, it's part of what happens in democracies. You know, your side, whatever, you know, let's say you're Democrat, yet lose. I mean, that's, that's a problem. So I, at the end of the day, even though there's times when I struggle with individual members of the, of the electorate, so to speak, I have faith in the collective judgments. And so... You know, let's uh, let's see how it happens, and and I'll uh, I'll be enjoying it. All right, let's thank John Gear. Thank you.